Welcome to Five Books for Catholics, where an expert selects and explains five outstanding books on some aspect of Catholic life, doctrine, or culture. The sacred scriptures are the Word of God. But, as the second letter of Peter, chapter 3, verse 16 says, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Consequently, the interpretation of sacred scripture has always involved difficulties and debates. These have become more intricate in modernity. The Protestant Reformation disputed the normativity of tradition and the Church's magisterium in the interpretation of scripture. The development of historical research has provided an array of new techniques and insights. Unfortunately, these have often been divorced from the rule of faith and wedded to rationalist premises instead. What then are the proper principles that allow us to hear what God is really saying to us in sacred scripture? On the one hand, the church teaches us to give priority to the literal or historical sense of scripture, taking into account the hagiograph's intention and modes of writing. On the other hand, as Pope Benedict XVI says in his post-synodal exhortation, Verbum Dei, since scripture must be interpreted in the same spirit in which it was written, the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on divine revelation indicates three fundamental criteria for an appreciation of the divine dimension of the Bible. First, the text must be interpreted with attention to the unity of the whole of Scripture. Nowadays, this is called canonical exegesis. Second, account is to be taken of the living tradition of the whole Church, And finally, third, respect must be shown for the analogy of faith. In the first part of this interview, Professor Jeffrey L. Morrow discussed his pick of the five best books on the principles of biblical interpretation. In this second part of the interview, Professor Morrow discusses some further recommended readings and his own research. Dr. Jeffrey L. Morrow is Professor of Theology at Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology at Seton Hall University. A Jewish convert to Catholicism, he specialises in the history of modern biblical interpretation. Among his publications are Jesus' Resurrection, A Jewish Convert Examines the Evidence, A Catholic Guide to the Old Testament, co-authored with Jeff Cavins and others, Murmuring Against Moses, The Contentious History and Contested Future, of Pentateuchal studies, before we authored with John Bergson, cover your and modern biblical criticism supplementary as a true statecraft. On a more Who personal note, could Scott you Hand. tell us a little bit about your own experience, how your reading, is, reading of Scripture has developed? Because Ooh. as a convert from Judaism, your reading of the Bible has probably developed much the same way as St. Paul's. First, you learned to read the Law and the Prophets under the guidance of the great rabbinical tradition. Then you encountered Christ and realized that everything in the law and the prophets regards him. I expect that your Jewish religious education helps you understand many ex- aspects of scripture better than cradle Catholics, for example. That's a huge question. So first of all, I wish I wish it was like St. Paul's uh, now, not then. Um, my, I was much more secular, so mine was not going to be as faithful as St. Paul's or as erudite. He was a much more scholar of the law than anything I could have claimed. I had never read the Bible. I mean, read parts of it. I had a bar mitzvah, went to Hebrew school, after school. Um, but I never read it the way he did or as thoroughly. Um, so I, I'll answer this as, as briefly as I can. It does help. So, yeah, so let me just go through my own evolution here, my own development here. Um, and what I would say is this. When I, when I grew up... Um, much more secular Jewish. I, when going to Hebrew school, uh, I even got into we even got into ethical debates. So I was reading Pirkei Avot, which is basically the ethical debates of the rabbis of the of the Avot of the fathers, which for us were the church fathers. They were the rabbis, as you mentioned, Maimonides, as later some of the medieval sages, but Akiva, uh, uh, Hillel, Gamaliel, some of the early um, early figures, um, and. So to me, the Bible, I just assume was mythology, just because I was more secularly minded. I was an agnostic. So I saw it as kind of mythology in the church and the, sorry, not the church fathers, the rabbis, I thought were interesting. Their debates were interesting. But to me, it was just kind of an important tradition. Um, that was that was basically it. 
But I celebrated the holidays and we had scripture at those holidays, uh, Passover especially. And that was important to me as a beautiful family tradition. When I became an undergraduate at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, that's when I started to attack the scripture as a skeptic because I was I was challenged by evangelicals. So my first real reading of scripture actually was through the evangelical Protestant lens, if you know, as a whole Bible where I read the entire Bible. So I became an evangelical Protestant in in much part because I was studying the history of the Bible. I became convinced it was historically reliable. I became convinced Jesus rose again from the dead. So I became an evangelical Protestant, and then I read the entire Bible. I read every book of the Bible, including the Deuteral Canon, the seven books, um, uh, 1 Maccabees, 2 Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, Sirach, Wisdom of Solomon, and Baruch, uh, that Catholics use that Protestants do not. I read all of those twice, second semester of my of my fraught freshman year of college. Um, and I began reading it just at the literal level, just the way I was learning as, a, as an evangelical. And I still stick with this as foundational. I still teach my seminarians to ask the simple questions, who, what, where, when, how, why. If you interrogate the text with that and try to find answers to those questions, you're going to get a lot out of Scripture. And for me, the most important thing was understanding the Bible, what was God telling me, and how to live. And then I became Catholic, studying the church fathers, reading the Bible in its historical context, um, reading the encyclicals of Pope St. John Paul II, who was the Pope of the time, and other th- other texts. And I began to understand the, the richness of the Catholic faith, the richness of reading this typologically, um, you know, the spiritual sense of Scripture. And then I started studying the Bible in graduate school as a theologian in training. And I became mystified by, you know, the, a lot of the way I was learning to read the Bible in graduate school as a Catholic, as a Catholic theologian in training, was the same skeptical methods that I was recognizing in my conversion were bankrupt. They weren't, they were not the strongest arguments historically. And they were, they were assumed from a position of fairly blind faith, and they were deconstructing the texts I had come to learn and love, that I had come to love in, in my life, you know, in the liturgy. And I was mystified. And so um, that's where I kind of began investigating the history of the historical critical method. It led me to do my own, my doctoral dissertation that I chose on how to read the Bible as a Catholic. Um, and and my most of my work since then actually has been trying to, to undermine the skeptics, to show that we need to have a healthy skepticism of the skeptics so that we can read the Bible again as a book of of God's love for me of God's love for us as our path to heaven in a sense. That's really what I what I did. So I would say my Jewish background helped me to really privilege, I think, the old in a way that I don't see a lot. And that helped me, in a sense, see how the sacraments in church tradition and doctrine were a full flowering of the Judaism of the Old Testament, rather than the abolishment that I found in many of the non-Catholic traditions I, I examined. It's obviously not true of Eastern Orthodoxy. It's obviously not true of some of the richer liturgical traditions, but it was true of some of the evangelicalism I was encountering. The first in your extended list of recommended readings is the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. Are you recommending the single volume of the New Testament or the individual volumes of the Old Testament and New Testament books? Whole thing. The whole thing. Okay. It is... It is the first place I go. Um, it is the first place I go uh, if I have a question about Scripture. I go to the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible that uh, Scott Hahn and Curtis Mitch co-authored. Uh, my understanding is eventually, hopefully soon, um, they're going to have an entire one volume. I'll have an essay in there, actually, an introductory essay. So hopefully the whole thing will be in one large volume, old and new. Right now, the old is just available as individual volumes the way that the new used to be available. This is where I go. The footnotes are great. They cite the Catechism, Vatican II church documents. Um, they give typological readings, anagogical, historical. They don't show all the scholarship, but a tremendous amount of scholarship went into this. And um, I, this is the first place I go. It's very accessible. I highly recommend it. And are you recommending it because of its critical apparatus, introductory notes, or is this also the translation, the English translation of scripture that you recommend? <sighs> Uh, yeah, all of the above. I would say um, the most important thing about it is the footnotes. It's not really a critical apparatus. It's where you would look for a critical apparatus. The yes. footnotes, that's where the actual running commentary is in their footnotes. 
They also have really good uh, charts and they have helpful essays on, on different words. If you want to understand the, the different types of, you know, expressions, you know, the Sadducees, Pharisees, Zealots, they have a, you know, a, they'll have a short one page essay on that, etc. Um, the translation is great. It's the uh, uh, RSV, the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. I will say in my personal opinion, I've become a convert to the English Standard Version Catholic Edition. Um, which it has everything that I love about the RSV Catholic edition, but where I have issues with the RSV Catholic edition, it, it, it does what I like. Um, it might, might have minor quibble points, maybe a couple words I might translate a little differently, but there's, you know, what are you going to do with an English translation where all, every scholar is going to come up with their own. But I, I, so I, I kind of moved where I, my regular daily reading in English is the English standard version Catholic edition and the Augustan Institute has published a wonderful ad, uh, American version that Americans can get access to in India has their own version but the, but the RSVC is fine I like it a lot I, it used to be what I would recommend and I still use it a lot it's my travel bible um but yeah I like everything about that that volume I like and biblical scholar Scott Hahn whom you've already mentioned several times is the author of the next two entries on your supplementary list. One is a theological commentary on the two books of Chronicles. The other traces one of the underlying themes that runs through the various books of the Bible, God's covenants. Do you recommend these books because they show us how to apply the principles of biblical interpretation in our reading of sacred scripture? Uh, one asked, yes and no. Not They don't apply all of these areas. I, I have to say that. These are written from a scholarly perspective for scholars. Um, kinship by covenant is the first one, and the second is uh, uh, the kingdom of God as liturgical empire. I think that's what it's called. So it's a commentary in First and Second Chronicles. I, I I recommend them because they apply the first. They're excellent at applying um, focusing on the human level. So if you look at the twelfth paragraph of of the dogmatic constitution and divine revelation from uh, De Verbum from Vatican II. You have this emphasis on genre, you have this emphasis on history, language, and, and he does an excellent job there. So Kinship by Covenant does a scholarly approach to looking at key sections of the Old Testament and the New, precisely where God makes significant covenants with the people and how they build on each other. And what he does is he uses not just the best of modern scholarly methods, but he uses what we know about the ancient Near East. So covenant making in the ancient Near Eastern traditions as we find those in the Bible. And what you see is this is a great example. What God is doing in the sacred scripture is an example of the divine condescension. The divine condescension is a technical theological term where God stoops down to our level to raise us up to his, to participate in his life. Best example of this is the incarnation. God be becomes one of us. He lives a human life in Jesus Christ. But scripture evidences this as well. So covenants were ancient Near Eastern means of entering into relationships. So God uses this method to enter into relationship with us. And so Scott shows how this builds to the coming of Jesus Christ. That's why I think that book, if you understand that book, you can get a sense of how the Bible makes sense from a scholarly perspective. The second is helpful because, you know, if you've read the whole Bible, you and you you probably see Leviticus and First Chronicles as the most difficult books to get into. Leviticus, it's all about sacrifices and rules. I think it's much more than that. I'd love to do a commentary, a popular commentary on Leviticus at some point in my life. Um, but it's really hard to get through. If you're just an ordinary lay person walking through the Bible, Leviticus, you stop at Leviticus and you're like, ah, I can't get into this. That's that was my first experience with Leviticus. And First Chronicles is next because it begins with all these genealogies. You're like, genealogies, can I just skip it and move on? And I've learned to love genealogies. I spend an entire class on, on Matthew's genealogy of Jesus in chapter one of Matthew. But you can do the same with each genealogy in First Chronicles. And so what Scott does is he makes First and Second Chronicles come alive. And he shows how they not only are a rereading of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. They are that with a focus on the temple and liturgy, which is the heart of the Davidic kingdom. They are that. And it's not only a looking forward to the coming of the Messiah in light of David and his kingdom, showing how the kingdom of God, the church, is patterned on the kingdom of God of the old, right? Um, David's kingdom, which is only called the kingdom of Yahweh in First and Second Chronicles. It is that. But it also summarizes all of the Old Testament history that came before. 
first and second chronicles at some level it's like the new testament of the old right isaiah can be seen that way in a hidden way genesis can be seen that way isaiah can be seen that way because it foreshadows christ in so many ways genesis can be seen that way because it kind of also foreshadows what's going to come but what first and second chronicles does is through the genealogies and the early stories is it takes up from adam through david it takes up all of salvation history and then the histories that we see in first samuel second samuel first kings and second kings right which goes through the davidic kingdom what came before saul and samuel solomon the split of the kingdom north and south the, the assyrian exile the babylonian exile the hope of a messiah so when we get to the prophetic books of the old testament the prophets are taking place during the books of mainly first and second kings and so second chronicles takes care of that so what scott does is he shows how these books he basically summarizes the old testament and shows how it points forward to the new just by walking through and explaining what first and second chronicles some of the most boring books of the old testament what it does for us so that that's why i recommended that you read those two books you will under and understand them you will understand the old testament and how it relates to the new your last recommended reading is Benedict XVI's three-volume Jesus of Nazareth. Is this another book that you recommend as a lesson on how to apply for oneself the principles of biblical interpretation? Yes, he yeah he he um he mentions especially in the book in the introductions to volume one and volume two he has a kind of short discussion on how are we supposed to read the Bible as Catholics in light of Vatican II. And and then he does it. I believe that volumes one through three. Sh I mean, I would quibble with you. Know, we get all quibble with like interpretive things here and there. I, obviously, this is not a magisterial text. In volume one, he opens and says, "This is the work of a private theologian. Everybody's free to contradict me." And there would be a couple minor quibble points I, I might have um, that are non-magisterial on his part. Um, but I think it's the best thing out there. This is really the best life of Jesus outside of Scripture um, in the modern sense that I can think of. They're just wonderful texts where he takes history seriously. Um, he takes history seriously. He takes the liturgy seriously. He takes the moral implications of scripture seriously. I believe what we find here is akin to, um, maybe not at the same level, but it's akin to what we find with Thomas Aquinas's commentaries in the gospel, maybe not at the same level. And I, I really don't think we've seen theological seeking the face of God in the interpretation of scripture like this at the papal magisterium since Pope St. Gregory the Great and his Moralia in Job, where he tries to look at the book of Job from a uh, spiritual interpretation and say, look, look, I'm a pastor. I'm the pastor of the universal church as pope. And let me let me talk to you about Job and how you can become a better Christian. I think G Benedict's doing the same thing with the life of Jesus. Let's look at the life of Jesus. Um, you know, as a private theologian, I'm se I'm seeking the face of God myself. I want to invite you to do the same with me. That's basically what Pope Benedict is doing in these volumes. And it's beautiful. Uh, my favorite is probably volume one. Um, it's beautiful where he basically lives out the sort of theological and historical interpretation of Scripture from the heart of the church that he had been calling for since at least the 1980s as Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, what he says is, uh, he gave a, a very famous presentation, Biblical Interpretation in Conflict, or Biblical Interpretation in Crisis in 1988, it was published in 1989 in English. And in the discussions after his lecture, when he gave it in New York in 88, um, he says, look, if traditional exegesis, traditional Christian exegesis is exegesis A, and modern scholarly historical exegesis is exegesis B, we don't want to just go back to A and ignore B, and we can't just do B. There's too many problems. We need a we need an exegesis C that takes the best of both seriously, and I believe that's what he's doing in this text, and that's why I think it's such an important text. I think you can learn about the life of Jesus, you can understand the Gospels better, and help you pray with the Gospels better, and you can understand how do we integrate historical findings, how do we understand Scripture in light of the liturgy. How should we read scripture aright? And I think he does a, a, a wonderful model. So yeah, I think mostly this is as a model of how to do this. Dr. Morrow, thank you very much once again for taking us through your pick of the best books and the principles of biblical interpretation. Thank you.
My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. To read or listen to the rest of this interview and gain full access to our archive, visit fivebooksforcatholics.com and become a premium subscriber. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and give it a top rating on the platform of your choice. That way more people can discover it. You can also support the podcast and help us produce more interviews like this one by making a one-off donation via the link given in the show notes. As little as one dollar, one pound or one euro can help and will be greatly appreciated. Thank you once again and God bless.